Hey y'all, welcome back to Detours. We are on week four, <laughs> day two, The Leash of Resentment, page 94. Buckle up, here comes another one. This is going to be a hard one again. All right, so let's pray. Precious Daddy, we just praise you for this day, Lord. We thank you for the breath of life and another day to glorify you, Father. We thank you for the forgiveness of sins, for our salvation, for you picking us out out of the whole world, Father, and choosing us to be your child and pursuing us and leading us into a relationship with you, Father. We are so grateful, Lord. We are so grateful for what you did on the cross, Lord, and we are so grateful that you are not dead but you are alive, you are seated at the right hand of the Father, Lord, and you are just holy and righteous and patient and loving and just full of kindness and grace and mercy, Lord. We ask, Father, that you would just have your will and your way in our lives. Fill us fresh and new with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Lead and guide us through this Bible study and through your word, Father, that is alive and amazing and speaks to us every day father and i just pray lord that you would do what only you can do in our lives lord change us to be more like your son jesus father and help us to be in the world but not of the world father help us to change our hearts and our minds and our actions father so that we can be your light and we can be storing up treasures in heaven lord and building your kingdom and doing your will and we will give you and you alone all the glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. You all ready? Day two, the leash of resentment. Many of us are being hindered from our destiny because we are being held hostage by a leash around our souls called unforgiveness. This leash keeps jerking us back. We take one step forward only to be jerked back to. Maybe it was something that happened in your childhood, or maybe it was an abusive or emotionally absent mate. Maybe you were forsaken, neglected, or even wrongly demoted or let go. Whatever it is, it's holding you hostage. Isn't it time you were set free? Did you know that the word used for forgiveness in the Bible is actually a math term? technically speaking. That's why when we hear it in the Lord's Prayer, it is specifically connected to debts. We are asking God to forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. It refers to an error in calculation where two numbers have been added wrongly and you have to recalculate or erase in order to begin again. So Matthew 6, 12 says, and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. So we have to do the second part before we get the first part. We have to forgive to be able to be forgiven. What does this verse mean to you? My debts can only be forgiven on the scale of my forgiving my debtors, those who have wronged me. I must forgive to be forgiven. In what way does refusing to forgive others impact God's relational forgiveness to you, according to this passage? He can't forgive me if I'm not forgiving others. It's so plain and simple, but we choose to ignore it, but it's a command. We have to forgive others to be able to be forgiven. Forgiveness has far more to do with a decision than a feeling. It has to do with whether you have made the choice to delete, delete, erase, whatever the offense. You may wonder how you are to know if you have made that choice since you can't gauge your decisions by your feelings. An excellent qualifying measure to help you know whether you have truly forgiven the offense and the offender is to ask yourself, are you still seeking revenge? If you are seeking revenge or payback or you internally delight in an offender's pain or bad circumstances, then you have not forgiven yet. 
You have not released this person from the pain he or she has caused you. And I've also learned in Celebrate Recovery through my 12 steps and stuff that if you have the grr factor, when that person's name is mentioned, when you talk about them, whatever, if your whole being is just going, grr, oh my gosh, you haven't forgiven. <laughs> I'm sorry, but you are still angry and bitter and resentful. And if you have that girl factor, you haven't forgiven yet. And that's something that we need to work on. Keep in mind, this also applies to you forgiving yourself. Far too many believers live under the weight of guilt and shame and fail to forgive themselves. This can lead to destructive behavior that can span the distance from overspending to overeating, to overdrinking, mm, that's the overeating part for me, to other methods of self-harm. Um, so, I learned when I was doing my abortion Bible study, she gave me this little book that I actually think I accidentally threw away. But it was so powerful for me. It was just this little teeny tiny booklet. And it had five things as to um, how to know that you have forgiven and what you needed to do. The one that really hit me hard, and I'm telling you, it was like God took a, f I don't even want to say a two by four. He took a mountain and hit me over the head with it and taught me this. It was just because... Celebrate Recovery talks about this. Everybody talks about it. Well, you need to forgive yourself. That's not biblical. Let me repeat that. Forgiving yourself is not biblical. You will not find it anywhere in the Bible. And if you do, let me know. But it is not biblical. We are to forgive others and we are to accept God's forgiveness. So I, we have questions in our Celebrate Recovery 12 step things that has to deal with this. That's why I always answer it this way because it's not biblical. If you have anger or hurt or whatever towards yourself, if you are putting yourself down, if you just hate yourself, whatever, your problem is not that you have to forgive yourself because that's unbiblical. I can't say that enough. It's because you have not accepted God's forgiveness. There's only two kinds of forgivenesses in the Bible. God's forgiveness and us forgiving others. That's it. That's it. There's no other. So stop thinking that you have to forgive yourself. That's a lie. That's a lie from Satan to hold us in chains. We don't have to forgive ourselves. We have to accept God's forgiveness. And when we accept God's forgiveness, that we truly believe and have faith that he has forgiven us, whether it's for our daily stuff or you're just a new believer and you've got the whole shebang you're laying at his feet, we have to accept God's forgiveness. So if you right now are sitting there with junk on your heart saying, I hate myself, I'm this person, I'm that person, whatever the case may be, and you think that you need to forgive yourself over something, I've done this, I've done that, whatever. No, you need to accept God's forgiveness. That's biblical. Forgiving yourself is not biblical. Okay, I hope you understand that. If you have any questions about that, let me know. But understand that there's only two forgiveness, accepting God's, asking God and accepting God's forgiveness and forgiving others. That's it. Forgiving ourselves is not biblical. So I read all that to be able to get to that because I want you to understand that even what he wrote right here is not right. We have to accept God's forgiveness. So if you have the weight of guilt, shame, whatever, you're not accepting God's forgiveness. And you need to ask him to help you. Because he will. And you have to walk out in that mustard side, mustard sized seed. No, nope, mustard seed size faith. <laughs> and accept God's forgiveness. Um, <clears throat> let's see. 
Have you, I'm not even going to read that next paragraph because it's, a, I had it highlighted, but it's, it's the same junk per se. So let, let, let's reword it a little bit. Accepting God's forgiveness is setting yourself free from the bitterness of wrath and anger towards yourself. And true forgiveness for others is setting yourself free from the bitterness of wrath and anger. If you are seeking revenge and desiring it, then forgiveness has not occurred because love does not keep a record of wrongs. And God is love. And he doesn't keep a record of wrongs, so we need to not keep a record of wrongs. When we are forgiven, it's done. When we forgive, it needs to be done. Okay? Have you ever thought you had forgiven someone only to later take delight in something negative that happened to them? If so, what did that internal delight reveal about your true state of forgiveness? I put yes. I'm sure that we all have done that. That I hadn't truly forgiven them. I still held unforgiveness and bitterness in my heart. Next question, do you think God takes delight in our pain because he holds a grudge against us for things we have done to him? Ouch. You always take that and switch that and put that in God's hands and, and position and ooh, that hurts. And I put no with an exclamation point. Um, how do you think God feels when we harbor ill feelings towards those we have been commanded by him to forgive. Now put it breaks his heart. He loves everybody and expects us to also even our enemies. And it blocks us from him too. It blocks our relationship. It makes us stagnant. It makes us stinky. We have flies just swarming all over us. We're just we're dying. We're dead. We're decaying. We're we're garbage. Because of the unforgiveness that is surrounding us. And it hurts him. He, he's sitting up there going, hmm. Yeah, I forgave you of all of that. But you can't forgive them for whatever. For talking rudely to you. Really? You can't forgive them? Even though, and let me tell you, I'm talking to myself right now. You can't forgive them for talking rudely to you and, and not respecting you when I forgave you for murdering. I mean, you've done the same thing. You've talked rudely and disrespectfully to people. You've treated people disrespectfully, but you're so high and mighty, Linda, that you can't forgive them? Mm, yeah, no, I'm not. I think I am sometimes, but I'm not. And actually, I don't even think I am. I just, I just focus on, mm. well, I didn't like what you did to me, so I don't like you anymore. <laughs> you know, I'm mad at you. Whatever. I'm not going to forgive you. This is like the gazillionth time that you've done this. I I'm just done. Well, that's why Jesus said to forgive forever and ever and ever and ever. <sighs> so I don't want to be blocked from God. And so I don't want unforgiveness. And I don't want the no the knowledge of I'm not being forgiven because I'm not forgiving. I, I don't want that. I don't want that. And I'm sure you don't either. And I'm not saying that it's easy. God knows it's not easy. Especially us with our prideful, self-righteous human hearts. He knows it's not easy. But it's still a command. Just like it's a command not to murder. Just like it's a command not to lie. Just like it's a command not to commit adultery. They're all commands for our well-being. Unforgiveness is not for our well-being. So we are commanded to forgive for our well-being and for the well-being of others. Hmm. Yep. Ugh. So read 2 Corinthians 1.3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. Mm. In what way are we to model the heart of God in our own relationships? Now put, we are to show mercy. We can't come to the mercy seat of God if we are not showing mercy ourselves. We need to forgive. We need to let it go. 
And we need to have a clean slate and new mercies every day. And I know that's hard. I, I, I really worked really hard at that with my last husband. Because he would lie to me every hour of every day. He would cheat on me with his pornography all the time in his head. He would do all this stuff. And every night, for a long patch of time, now I'm not saying I was perfect because at the end I was just done and I walked the wrong way. But I forgave. I forgave every day. I let it go at night because I didn't want to carry it. I didn't want to carry it. And I wish I'd continued in that instead of waiting so long at the end because it, it, it hurt me. And it hurt a lot of people around me. And I would wake up in the morning and be like, okay, today's a new day. His mercies are new every morning. I, I have a clean slate in God's eyes. I have new mercies waiting for me. So I need to extend that to him. Well, I can honestly say I, I ended up giving up on that. And praise God, God doesn't. He doesn't. But he can't shower his new mercies and give us a clean slate if we are not forgiving others. Does that make sense? It does for me. And since I'm the one staring at myself on the screen, I'm going to answer myself because I'm just weird that way. But but it makes sense, you know, and, and I get it. It's hard and I need to do it too. So don't think that I'm like, I'm like, because the condemnation is coming to me first. Not the condemnation, the conviction is coming to me first and just flowing out of my mouth to y'all because we're all imperfect human beings. So I know that all of us are struggling with this. Um, so he asks, is it possible to give comfort and show mercy to someone you have failed to forgive? Why or why not? Well, let's seriously think about this. I mean, let's use my example. My husband was addicted to porn. I'd catch him on his phone, do whatever. He'd be, there'd be stuff on the iPad that he was looking at really weird commercials or whatever that my kids could find, whatever. I, I knew when he was sitting on the couch when we were watching TV when he was thinking about it. I mean, I just knew. I just knew. Okay, so I, I'm getting angrier. The bitterness is growing deeper. The The hate and the rage is growing deeper. So... If something happened to him, could I give comfort and show mercy? Oh, no. Mm -mm. If one of his kids were hurting or going through a struggle, I'd be like, whatever. And in my mind, I'd be thinking, well, look who their father is. <laughs> you know? I mean, I'm just, I'm being flat out honest here. You know, look at what you've taught them, you know? And uh, and so, no, it, it is absolutely impossible to show mercy and give comfort to someone that you haven't forgiven because you don't have that in you to feel because you're so hard and so angry and so bitter and so resentful that whatever happens to them, heck, they could cut their arm off and you'd be like, it's okay. I mean, you might show a little bit, but I mean, honestly, deep down, it would probably be fake. You might do your wifely duties or whatever the case may be and be like, okay, I guess I'm going to have to waste my time sitting in the hospital. You actually might shed some tears because, you know, there is love still there, whatever. But for the most part, if you really dig deep, you'd be like, well, maybe God's getting you back. You know, I mean, there's just, there's all those thoughts that run through our crazy heads. So, no, it, it, it's just, it, you might be able to show a little bit, but is it really real? Is it really real? Is it Christ-like? Or is it? The fake, well, I'm going to pretend so you think that I care, but I really don't care. Kind of love that the world shows us. Yeah, for me, I put, it's a, it's a big fat no. It's blocked, any of that, comfort, mercy, whatever, is blocked by unforgiveness. It's impossible to truly care and be merciful, merciful if I haven't let it go and forgiven. It, it's just It's just a big fat no, and if you are doing it, it's probably fake, and they might know it. Deep down, you know it, and most importantly, God knows it. God knows it. He knows it's fake because it just is. 
So I often compare the effect of sin in our lives, either done to us or done by us, to a wound or a cut on the soul. As with all wounds, if that is left untreated, it will simply fester and rot and become a place where bacteria has freedom to flourish. Wounds of the soul are no different. When left untreated, they fill up with things like bitterness, regret, envy, jealousy, resentment, self-loathing, hate, and more. As all of this rises to the surface of our soul, causing inflammation in our hearts, even the slightest offense against us can bring about great pain. We often call this overreacting. And ain't that the truth? And if you're mad at someone, if you are just covered in unforgiveness and it is just overflowing and oozing out of every pore in their body, oh, just the slightest little whatever will just set off the volcano. I mean, they could raise their eyebrow at you or, you know, kind of smirk at you or say something and you just took it sarcastically or Whatever the case may be, they do one little tiny minuscule thing wrong and it's like the whole world just exploded. And that's that's how it is. That's how it is because in reality, if you didn't have all of that and you had already forgiven, it would have been like, oh, okay, well, you know, whatever. That's That's not that big of a deal and you wouldn't respond the way you do. Or I should say react the way you do. Um... But uh, when it when it's just building, 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 it's only going to take just a little teeny tiny speck to just make it humongous. Um, so it says, identify a time in your life when you allowed unforgiveness to fester and rot or someone else you know allowed this to happen in their lives. Were there any overreactions to life circumstances as a result? So, somebody in my life has been saying the phrase, no offense, either before or after a statement. That was very offensive. <laughs> it was very offensive. Um, and if you, if you, you know what I'm learning through all of this is that if you have to say no offense before, or after you're saying something, you darn well shouldn't be saying it or you should be rewording it because it's going to be offensive. You know, it's going to be offensive. You know, it has been offensive because you're saying the words, no offense, but yeah, you, you can't sweeten what you just said or what you're about to say with those two words. It, it just doesn't work that way. And so, you know, some of these things, for me, I probably wouldn't even thought of. I wouldn't even rehash it in my mind. It would have just gone in one ear and out the other. But those two words were tagged on it. And so then I concentrated on what was being said. And yes, they were very offensive. The wording was, you are a crappy person period. I'm going to be honest, crappy mama. You did this and 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 so I stopped doing this, but now I can do it because I'm not doing the teaching that you told me to. I'm doing whatever I want. But no offense. Well, hello Satan used that to put me in the ditch for days and I'm still this is my big thing that this week has really bothered me with. And and this wasn't a one shot deal. This was you know, that no offense was only a one-shot deal, but then this person said something else, and this person said something else, and this person said something else, and then about a week later, this person said something else, and it was just constant, 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 constant. So, that statement is pissing me off, <laughs> to be flat out on with you, I just, I can't stand that. But I'm also trying to learn something about that, because I'm catching myself saying it, and I'm like, oh crap, wait a minute. If I got to say no offense, it's going to be the wrong thing. I'm going to shut up now or I'm going to reword it so it's polite and non-offensive. Um, so, you know, when, when those two words are used in that sentence, it, it's, it's magnetized a gazillion times over than what it normally would be. For the most part, there are some things that have been said that, that I probably would have caught on to, but 
anyway, so yeah, that, that, that's mine. That's mine in the last couple weeks. So, read Matthew 18. I'm going to take a drink right fast. 21 through 35 says, Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. So, I got veggie tails in my head right now because of my daughter, but... That's 490. <laughs> and so imagine, and, and there are some people, imagine in one day, and 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 this isn't just a, a, a whole lifetime thing. You gotta figure this is a daily thing. 490 times for one person in one day. That's a lot. That's a lot. I mean, can you even really count that many offenses from one person in one day? Probably not. Unless you're counting like really itty bitty things that because of your unforgiveness is just being so magnetized. So, Jesus is saying here, don't keep count. Just forgive. I don't keep count. I just forgive. So don't you keep count. Just forgive. Don't have it in your head. Well, I've already forgiven you 699 times today. Are you kidding me? No. Just forgive. Because Jesus has probably forgiven us 1,500 times in the last hour. And he just forgives. That's love. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. So remember, it's all about money. It's all about a debt owed. When he had begun to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. I can't even imagine that being a poor servant slave own, owing somebody that much money. I guess it's us being poor servant slaves to credit cards and owing that much money and imagine it was just all one company and but since he did not have the means to repay his lord commanded him to be sold along with his wife and children and all that he had and repayment to be made now think about that so you sell you you make this massive debt i don't know what you bought but you make this massive debt then they come to collect it. They want it in full. So he commands that he sold. His wife is sold. The children are sold. Everything that they have is sold. And they still have to repay it. But how in the world are you going to do that? I mean, that's how extreme it is. How in the world are you going to do that? If you're sold, <laughs> everything's sold, you have nothing, you're working as a slave and you're not making any money. So how are you going to repay 15 gazillion dollars? It's impossible. It's impossible. So the slave fell to the ground because he knows it's impossible. And he's like, oh my gosh, what have I done? And my family and oh my goodness, I can't do this. So the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him saying, have patience with me. And I will repay you everything. And the Lord of the slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. So because of his forgiveness, he had compassion and he released him. Mm. That's what we need to do. That's what we need to do, ladies, for everybody. But that slave, here we come, here we come. We are that slave. That slave who had just been forgiven everything, everything. So it's like when we come 
in the beginning of our salvation, we get born again and we ask God to forgive us of all of our sins that we have done from our first second of breath until whatever age we are, all of that has been forgiven in one shot when we pray the prayer of salvation and get born again. So, we are that slave now. So, he has been forgiven of everything. So, let's, let, let's visualize this. So, he is now, let's put this into perspective, a born-again believer. Okay? Let, let's kind of rearrange this here a little bit. <clears throat> but that slave, that born-again believer that we're, we're saying he is, so we can relate him to us, went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. So we're talking, let's, let's, because I don't remember the exact amounts and I don't have my Bible on me. Let, let's say 1500 or $15 million to $200. Okay, Let, let's put that in perspective. So he, when he got, when he got forgiven of his debt, it was $15 million. Okay, so again, we're, we're kind of paralleling it to salvation. Okay, so he got born again, was forgiven all that debt. Okay, then he goes out completely and utterly forgetting what he had just been forgiven of. And he goes out to someone who owes him $200. Okay, little sins, little debt, little, little hurts, little whatever compared to all that we had done. In our past. <clears throat> and he seized him. And began to choke him. So he grabs onto him. He captures him. And he begins to choke him. Over a hundred denarii. A couple hundred dollars. But we have been forgiven everything. He had been forgiven. The ultimate debt. But he didn't grasp the concept of what he had been forgiven. And he goes and condemns someone else. Ouch. Pay back what you owe. There's the revenge. I'm getting revenge. I want what you owe me. You hurt me. You owe me. You said negative things to me. You owe me. You owe me money. You owe me. You disrespected me. You owe me. So I'm going to uh, get revenge on you in whatever way, form, or possible. Even though I have been forgiven everything. Uh, you don't deserve the forgiveness. So I'm going to take out my revenge on you. Yeah. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him saying, have patience with me and I will repay you. The exact same words, word for word. The words that the first slave used are the words that the second slave used. But when it's ourselves, those words matter and our debts being forgiven matters. But when someone else uses the exact same words, we do what this man did. But he was unwilling. He was unwilling to forgive. And he went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what was owed. Mm. That's exactly what we do when we don't forgive. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. Wow, I've never thought about that before. This is the first time I've associated it with someone being saved like this. So let, let, let's rewind a little bit. So the first slave gets saved on that parallel. He has his debts. He has to be forgiven. He has to be saved. He becomes a born-again believer. He becomes a child of Christ. All of his debt is forgiven. Done. Gone. Forgiven. Whatever. But then the little born-again believer goes out and can't forgive 
the little teeny tiny debt of someone else, one of his friends or his husband or his wife. I guess I shouldn't say his husband. <laughs> his wife, his child, his employer, whatever. He can't forgive. He can't forgive. Even though he's just been totally forgiven of everything that he's ever done in this humongous weight. He can't forgive. He's forgotten what he has been forgiven of or it didn't really matter to him. And he can't forgive. And the others around, family, close friends, they know that he got saved. They know that he got forgiven. And then they turn around and watch him not be able to forgive. So, so let's put this in kindergarten terms. He gets saved. This is the husband. He gets saved. He becomes a child of God. His best friend owes him $200. He can't forgive him in the, that debt. He's harping on him. He's beating the crap out of him, whatever. Okay? So he's now a saved, born-again Christian who's beating the crud out of someone for owing him a couple hundred dollars, putting him down, yelling at him, calling him a dirt bag, whatever the case may be. The wife, the children, the neighbors, the everybody... Everybody, 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 everybody is watching this born-again believer who claims Christ now not be able to forgive another person. There's people watching us. There's people hearing that we are followers of Christ and they're watching us not forgive. They're watching us do exactly what this man did. And we're not leading anybody to Christ that way. And we're not building God's kingdom that way. Because we're not following the word of God that way. Ouch. <laughs> this is hurtful. Very convicting. So when his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, his Lord, so imagine Jesus, said to him, You wicked slave. I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. So here's Jesus talking to Linda, who has unforgiveness for whomever. Linda, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. You begged me to forgive you. You begged me to forgive you. Should you, Linda, not also have had mercy on your fellow friend, on your fellow Christian, on your fellow brother and sister, on your daughter, on your son, on your husband, on your whatever. In the same way. Not in a sort of same way. Not in a halfway same way. In the same way that I, your Lord and Savior, had mercy on you. Yes, Lord, I should, but darn it, I don't. Please change me. Please help me, Lord. Mm. I don't know about y'all, but I'm being convicted so hard right now. And I hope that God is doing the same to you because we need to be changed, sisters. We need to be changed. And his Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers, until he should repay all that was owed him. My, this is Jesus, my heavenly father will also do the same to you. If each of us, you, me, everybody, does not forgive their brother from their heart. Does not forgive his brother from your heart. Doesn't say from your feelings. It doesn't say from your mind. From your heart. Where the life blood flows. Your heart. Your heart. I don't want to be not forgiven. And I don't want to be that person who could be forgiven so Dang much. But choose not to forgive others because of their little bit. Mm. 
This was some good stuff, ladies. Pay particular attention to verse 34 and 35. What does this passage say will happen to you if and when you choose not to forgive? God will get angry because of my choosing disobedience to his command and hand me over to the consequences, illnesses, pain of my choice until I forgive. And there will also be that humongous bridge between us and I will be piled and piled on with stuff that I have not been forgiven because I refuse to forgive. And there will be a breach in the trust. There will be a breach in the relationship between God and I. And I don't want that. And I know you guys don't either. At least I hope you don't. And we need to seriously work on this because we do it a lot. We do it a lot especially in the body of Christ. We do it a lot. And our self-righteousness and our prideful ways, they need to be put into the pits of hell where they belong. Oh. The man in this parable who chose not to forgive was literally thrown in a jail and tortured. Similarly, when we choose not to forgive, our own hearts and souls and minds become a jail cell of resentment and personal torture. Personal torture. The person who offended us is not torturing us anymore. The person who hurt us is not continuing to hurt us anymore. He's not in this moment. I mean, you may live with them and they may continue to, but you get what I'm saying. In this moment, they're not standing right here in front of me doing it. But if it's living in my mind and my heart, it's turned into a personal torture. I'm torturing myself with what they did because I keep hitting myself, cutting myself, whatever the case may be, stabbing myself with it over and over and over again. When it only had to happen once. Every time we reiterate it in our minds, in our minds, in our minds, we're doing it to ourselves. We're hurting ourselves. And it's ridiculous. And I am the worst of the worst at that. To live in this... <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> to live in this state of mind creates a cesspool of sin within us. That ushers in torture, whether it be in our relationships, career, self-worth, or more. Forgiveness is a command. When we are disobedient to this command, we are questioning our, the sovereignty of our all-powerful God and King. We are holding others to a higher standard than He has held for us. Mm, 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 mm. Ouch. As a result, we will remain in the pit of our detours and in the company of our own pain. Wow. I done warned you this week was not going to be easy. And man, I've already been through this once and it's probably harder the second time because I'm reading it out loud. And probably because I have a little bit more that I haven't done. Yep. Oh boy, we have a lot of work to do, ladies. We need to get on it so we can get on with God's will. And so we can get on with our destiny. And so we can get on with building the kingdom of Christ. And leading others to him. And shining the light of Jesus and what he has forgiven us. We must forgive others let's pray dear father you are already open my eyes open all of our eyes to those areas in our lives where bitterness and refusal to forgive are anchored like boats in a marina lord please do not let us hold someone else to a standard that is higher than the one to which you have held us you through the death of your sinless son, Jesus Christ, have forgiven me, us, of all of our sins. Help us to tap into the depth 
and strength of your grace to do likewise for others who have hurt us. I know you can and you will use all these things to work together for good when we live according to your purposes and trust your plans. Lord, you are just so good. Your conviction is so loving and kind, but deep and heart-wrenching, Lord, because you don't want us to stay where we are at. You don't want this unforgiveness inside of us, Lord. You don't want all this bitterness and anger and negative thoughts, Lord, because it's affecting our relationship with you. It's affecting ourselves and it's affecting others. And the body of Christ is watching us and non-believers are watching us, Lord, and they're seeing our unforgiveness and they can't see yours, Father. And we are pushing them away from you, Lord. Forgive us, Lord, and help us to forgive others as we have been forgiven. Lead and guide us, Lord. Break us, Father. Make our hearts pliable for your living water. Put them on the potter's wheel and mold them into who you want them to be, Father. Change us, Lord. Change us, Lord, and have your will in your way. We love you, and we thank you, and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. It's not going to get easier this week, ladies. I will be praying for y'all. Keep coming back. Keep working hard. And let's work on this unforgiveness because time is short. And we don't want to be caught with all this unforgiveness in our hearts. And I don't know about you, but I don't want my relationship to have a big old gap in it. Because he can't forgive me because I won't forgive others. Take it, learn from it, release it, and walk in freedom, ladies. Y'all have a blessed week. If you need me, you know where to find me. Reach out. God bless.